You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for hitting that play button. This is another episode of the Dave Willis Podcast. Before we get to today's episode, I just want to say two very quick things. If you're looking to start your own podcast and you want to pick my brain for free, I'm again hosting Office Hours. You can find the link at on the show notes at DaveBullis.com. Or if you want a little more in-depth notes, I also am offering a gig on Fiverr, five bucks, and then you can pick my brain about whatever you'd like about podcasting. Also, I'm offering a free filmmaking group. If you listen to this podcast and want to be a part of my filmmaking group, the Dave Bullis Podcast Filmmaking Group, it's 100% free. It's on Facebook. There's a link to the group. Just send me a uh, request and uh, I will uh, add you to the group. No hidden fees, nothing like that. You know, I'm really excited about this episode. Uh, There's just so many questions I wanted to get to that we never got a chance to get to because that hour flew by. Um, This is such a great conversation, particularly if you're getting into cinematography, which I am more and more. For those of you who follow me on social media, I actually just bought myself a DSLR kit and I've been sort of piecing this together. Uh, the first instance I, I was using this with, uh, I shot some photos at Wizard World, which you can, again, see on DaveBullis.com. And I also now have you know gone out and just done some nature photography stuff. And I really want to start getting into back into the groove of all this. Because as listeners to the show know, there's so many times that we can just lose you know, just touch with this because you just have, you start a family, you go back to school, you lose a job, uh, you get burned out. You just don't, you know what I mean? You, you just never want to start because you're always writing the same script or always finding an excuse or you can't find a good project. There's a million and one reasons. And that's one of the best parts about this podcast is not only is it an experiment on my, my half, but it's also a creative outlet, but you also get to hear all these awesome stories and, and, and so many great stories on this podcast. And that's why I'm so glad that you know, I have I have all you great listeners out there, and I'm also so glad that I have my next guest. He has been the director of cinematography for such films as Monster, directed by Patty Jenkins, who just directed Wonder Woman, uh, Kicking and Screaming, directed by Noah Baumbach, and Like Water for Chocolate. He's also been the director of cinematography for comedies like The Water Boy, Half Baked, Scary Movie Two, White Chicks, and he's done uh, action films like SWAT. And he also wrote a film, a textbook called Film Production. And his latest films, Decoding Annie Parker and Dominion, have included actors like Aaron Paul, John Malkovich, Helen Hunt, just to name a few. And currently he's actually teaching some really cool online and offline seminars, which again, I'll link to in the show notes. We're going to talk about a lot of really cool stuff on this podcast episode. This is episode 166 with guest Stephen Bernstein. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. So, Stephen, just to get started, you know, you've done a lot of really amazing work. Uh, you've done a lot of work as a cinematographer, uh, you know, it, starting in, you know, the, the late 80s, and you've done all these wonderful projects. And I wanted to ask how you got to that point. I mean, that's sort of the, the impetus to a lot of interviews and a lot of, you know, people who've, who've been able to really ascend up that, that proverbial ladder is, you know, how did you get to that point? So what I want to ask you, Steve, is, did you to just to sort of start this off? Did you go to film school, you know, uh, to be a cinematographer, or, or did you do have a, or did you have a completely different sort of entryway into this industry? A completely different entryway. I had wanted to be a, a writer and uh, read or, or majored in a philosophy uh, at uh, university. When I came out, uh, there were various job opportunities of different types one of which was at the BBC on a training program, which I enrolled in and studied there as a writer, director, researcher, and worked in long-form documentary. Great because it allowed me to travel a great deal, which was an interest of mine then, and I got to go to China, Hong Kong, Philippines, Vietnam, South America, 
South Africa during apartheid, what was then Rhodesia, later became Zimbabwe. So a lot of adventures, a lot of really interesting shoots and some great experiences, but not really that satisfying and not, as it turned out, my calling. I came back to London and continued working at the BBC about the time that uh, music videos uh, became of interest. Uh, the first few music videos would be produced, and I got to shoot a few of those. And soon I was in demand, not as a director or as a writer, but as a uh, what was called then a lighting cameraman, a cinematographer, and shot a lot of really interesting music videos for some really then very big bands in the uh, in the 80s, um, Eurythmics and so on. Um, and that led to uh, interest from others and got into commercials, worked with the great Tony Kay, did some really important commercials with him, uh, some of which won the Con Golden Lion, the DAD Award, and then I was kind of uh, on the map. Still, my intention always had been to be a writer. So it's funny the way life works in that you tend to go with those things that are providing you income inevitably. You can have good intentions, but overheads, life, expenses being what they are, you do what you have to do. So I was shooting, enjoying it, particularly the music videos and the commercials, but I was still writing plays, uh, films, short films, some of which appeared on Channel 4 in, in the UK, some got on the stage in, in London, but really nothing that provided me any sort of success. And then along came Like Water for Chocolate. Um, my friend uh, Gabrielle Beristain had been offered the work completing that movie, which had run into a little bit of trouble, and he couldn't do it. Um, so they asked me to go to Mexico and finish the film, which I did. It's a big hit in America, the highest, foreign, highest grossing foreign language film of all time to date. Uh, and uh, I then came to America to see if there was work to be had here. And that led to all those uh, studio films, those comedies with uh, Adam Sandler, with the Wayans, and so on. And that, in turn, led to my meeting uh, the great Noah Baumbach and starting an independent uh, films in America. And uh, that, in turn, led to Monster. So I'm trying to uh, compress uh, what is now seeming a very long career into a very short period of time, but uh, a happy series of accidents uh, doing what I never intended to do, uh, ending up in a place I never intended to come to, and somehow working my way back towards my first intention. Yeah, you know, and it's funny how it, it all sort of comes full, full circle, right? You start off with one intention, you, 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 have, you find yourself in all these new situations, but you took advantage of those situations, and, and you know, you you turn them all into opportunities, and now you're you know, and now we're going, you're going back to writing, and I think there's something poetic in that, because I think as we, when when we as filmmakers, and and whether we're writers or, or directors, when we start our careers. You know, we have an idea of what it's going to be. And usually everyone has an idea that it's going to be, you know, you're going to make a movie at 22, you're going to win Sundance, <laughs> you're going to make a million dollars, and then <laughs> you're going to move to Hollywood. And and, it, and, and, and 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 you know, Steve, it doesn't really work out that way. It's a lot of zigzags towards that sort of path. And, uh, you know, and it's just a, that's why I do this podcast, because there's so many interesting stories like yours where it's not just one way. In fact, with all these episodes, there's so many different ways of doing things. But but the point I'm trying to make is, you know, that that's the thing about the intention that we have and how life sort of throws out all these obstacles and how we respond to them and how we yeah, how we respond to them really dictates, you know, what course our life is going to go on. I think you're you're absolutely right. And it goes to the great complexity that, that life offers us, which is. Do we uh, earn a dollar? Uh, do we do what makes us the, the, the maximum amount of uh, profit all the time? Or do we hold on to uh, an individual dream and simply uh, wait it out? It's very interesting because I've done both. Um, when I started, I make no apology to say that I was kind of an opportunist. I was taking what was offered to me. And look, it was a fun ride. I got to, again, travel a lot, uh, both first with the BBC and then doing music videos. I got to meet really interesting uh, uh, people, uh, particularly in the 80s, and 
the bands we were dealing with and the concerts we were doing and the videos we were doing, all very, very exciting. But really, it was the work that was offered, and I took advantage of that. Later, when I went to make my first film, Decoding Annie Parker, I had seen other people try to make that same transition to director. And they tried to keep their day job, as it were, and none of them succeeded. So I resolved that I would give up everything to do with cinematography. I would give up anything to do uh, that didn't directly point me towards directing. And that's what I did. And sadly, decoding did not happen quickly. We were promised money. That money went away. We were promised other money. That money went away. And I spent nearly five years unemployed and went through all my savings and most of my possessions and was in abject poverty on the day we finally uh, got funded and then went uh, to shooting. So both courses interesting. I think ultimately the latter one more painful. You sacrifice a great deal, but if you hold out for the dream, maybe you achieve it. Yeah, and, and you know, holding out for the dream, it's kind of like uh, Sid Haig, you know, he, he people once asked him about his acting career and he had actually given up. He actually, you know, sort of went away for a, a long while because he said every every role that he was offered was basically uh, he w- he became in as a man with a gun. He came in through the door holding a gun or he came in, you know, he was already in the room with the gun. And <laughs> what happened was he, he came back because, you know, he actually liked it. And and finally, he said, you know, I, I realize now he's in movies with Tarantino and, and Robert and Rob Zombie and he said, you know, it's like Winston Churchill said, never quit, never quit, never quit. I think that's uh, absolutely right. And there's a great example of this that, that we know. I mean, Patty Jenkins, a um, uh, dear friend of mine, um, Patty uh, was the director of Monster, which uh, I shot. The story is interesting, uh, both how our relationship began and how uh, Patty uh, built her career. I was shooting uh, the big second unit on SWAT. 21 cameras, tons of effects. We're spending millions of dollars blowing up the front of the library in Los Angeles, crashing planes, shooting rockets into cars. It was everything I thought I dreamt of when I was a young cinematographer. And then after four months of that, uh, I got a call from Clark Peterson, uh, the producer of Monster I'd known for years. The film was in some trouble uh, in uh, Florida. And he asked if I would read the script, speak to the first time director and consider leaving SWAT and coming to Florida to shoot Monster. And I read the script. I thought it was great. I spoke to Patty on the phone and was struck by her intelligence, her sensitivity, uh, her command of the subject matter um, and of herself. I just sensed that she would be a great leader and agreed and uh, came down at um, about one twentieth of what I was getting paid on SWAT arrived in Florida to this tiny little film that was uh, underfunded, uh, under-equipped, and in real trouble. And we began working together. And for me, it was a epiphany because I saw people of absolute and genuine integrity completely believing in the art they were undertaking to create. And Charlize was self-sacrificing um, and the role was agonizing and difficult for her, but she pushed through, um, as did uh, Patty. And then, of course, Monster, when we finished it, no one would buy it, which a lot of people don't know. Blockbuster would be the only people that would put forward uh, a not very good uh, offer, which was taken. With the proviso, the film would get a very limited theatrical release. And amazing to them, and I guess to kind of everybody, the film got spectacular reviews um, in the papers. Uh, uh, Patty ended up along with Charlize on, on Charlie Rose, and then we went to uh, Berlin where um, they, Charlize won the Silver Lion, then um, a Silver Bear, rather, then the Golden Globe, then the Oscar, of course, and the rest is kind of legend. Right after that, uh, Patty was offered pretty much everything from studios. And you or I, or I don't mean to speak for you, but let's say someone like me, <laughs> would, uh, would have taken that opportunity, work on a studio, be paid a million or two million. I don't know what she's offered, but a lot. But Patty uh, had a vision of what she wanted to do. And remarkably, and this goes to her character, she said no. 
Um, these aren't the films that I uh, want to do. She wanted to do a film about Chuck Yeager. She had some other uh, projects that were interesting to her. And she was going to hold out, as I did on my film, uh, for what uh, she was waiting for and what she believed she'd be adept at, uh, at, at doing and achieving. And waited and waited. Did some television pilots, very successful ones, um, The Killing, which she did a great job on. And then along came Wonder Woman. And Patty said, yeah, here's a strong woman uh, with a voice that I find interesting, uh, a subject matter that I've always liked. I'm going to make this film. And what did it do this weekend? I mean, it was spectacular. And it's not just the box office revenue it generated. Look at the reviews it's getting. So that's uh, Patty's remarkable and I think instructional, uh, instructional journey. You know, I once met uh, Kane Hodder. And Kane actually said the best actor, actress that he ever worked with was Charlize Theron. And he said she was not only is she, uh, was she very nice to everybody with no airs whatsoever, but he said when the time came, she was absolutely amazing every single take, every single day. He's like, she never did a bad take, not one time. And when you see something like Monster, it, it, it's, you know, because cause Charlize is a beautiful woman. And then, you know, she transformed herself with all the makeup and she really became that role. Uh, you know, I, I had on um, a couple of different acting coaches and they said that was the secret of acting is that you don't act like like you're a person. You are that person. I think that's spot on. And, you know, look, I have the uh, re remarkable distinction of being the one cinematographer that managed to make uh, Charlize Theron look bad. So it's very, very <laughs> special. And I'm, I'm very proud of myself. And, and Charlize was very proud of me. But she and I worked very hard on making her look bad. One, that goes to her great courage, because, look, uh, an actress's beauty is in part her commodity in Hollywood. And the fact that Charlize, uh, like Patty before her, had such an integrity of vision that she was willing to sacrifice her commodity value in the pursuit of art goes to the person that she is. And secondly, uh, you're absolutely right about the quality of Charlize's performance. And she does this strange hybrid of uh, method acting and more uh, classical approaches. She knows the material. She's always off page. She gets it completely. She intellectually understands and engages with the topic and knows her character and the character's arc. But in the moment, uh, she is a, a method actor. She is uh, completely engaged. And uh, as your acting coach, uh, a person that you interviewed said, um, she became um, that character. Um, we believe she was that person completely. You know, there's a remarkable thing that happened on Monster uh, one day where it was a, a key moment when um, Christina Ricci and Charlie Theron, the two characters, were saying goodbye to each other at a train station. And they both had worked their way into this uh, emotional uh, high. This, there was a sense of intensity. And if you know film sets, as I'm sure you do, the, the crews, you know, just carry on um, eating their sandwiches and lying down their track and doing what crews do. But something remarkable happened this day, and the crew just sensed that they wanted to support uh, Christina and Charlize and, and what they were pursuing. So the crew decided unilaterally not to speak that day. And the crew was uh, communicating with each other with hand signals and with pointing and occasionally a whispered word. But it was dead quiet on that set for the entire uh, sequence. And it was one of the most magical moments I remember in any film I've ever worked on. This sense of synergy of all of us working together to support what we felt was uh, the achievement of, of great art. And I think it facilitated those two performances in that remarkable film. Uh, I mean, and, and see, stories like that are, are just so interesting to hear, uh, you know, just working with different actors over the years and, and seeing all the different methods and different approaches. And it's very interesting to see the crew, you know, responding in that method, the crew responding and, and being very, very receptive and helping Charlize and, 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 and Christina Ricci and, and doing something like that. It's just very interesting to me when, when, cause, because you I mean, you've been, you've seen a lot of sets, Steve, where, the the crew ends up and the crew and the, and the cast they end up becoming like a family because you're spending you know days and into weeks and into months making this film and it almost becomes like a child for everybody you know and 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 everyone's a team player uh, and they all want to see you know what's best for for this project that they've worked uh, for so long on. 
I, th I think you're exactly right. And, and this is the thing I think that's most attractive about film is you do acquire a family for a few months or a few um, weeks or um, one of the films I did in India for a year where you're all under uh, great pressure, but you're all mutually dependent on each other. And you're isolated from the rest of the world and you feel somehow um, special, not special as in entitled, but that somehow the way you are mediating the world is different from the way you mediate the world in the civilian or non-film world. So the camaraderie uh, and friendships that are built on film sets to me are still singular and my closest friends all come from film and the most intense experiences in my life generally have occurred on film sets. And I must tell you, there's never been a film that I've worked on, however bad the film may have been, where uh, it wasn't followed, at least for me, by a profound depression that would last days or weeks. And I think I speak for virtually uh, all film crews and actors. Uh, when you walk away from your family and just say, OK, this film's done, I'm going back home now. Uh, home doesn't seem like home. The set was home. And there's a peculiar transition stage, which uh, some people never get over. You, you know, you're absolutely right, Steve. I, I've I've been on a lot of sets like that where it's almost, you know, it, it's I don't want to use this expression, but I will. It's almost like a high. It's almost like yeah. this this feeling, this energy. Actually, energy is a better word than high. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's this energy that you feel. And, you know, you, you just sort of whenever, especially when everybody is, is is gelling together and everyone's there and they're professional and they're all working together. It's that, you know, you, you get that feeling and, and you want to, you know, and, and when you leave and the, the project's over, you sort of go home and you're like, what am I going to do now? I guess I huh? uh, better watch Netflix and uh, you know order a pizza. <laughs> right. It's yeah. like but you, yeah. you, you want that feeling again so much. No, absolutely. Right. To the point where uh, it's like a. Uh, maybe high is better because you're like an <laughs> addict. You'll be, you'll be walking down the street and you'll you'll see another film shooting. You sort of wander over, thinking that you might be able to pick up on some of that uh, energy. Maybe they'll invite you to lunch, but it's uh, it's something that you that you absolutely miss when you're not doing it. And listen, that's one of the problems I have uh, when I move from cinematographer to uh, writer, director, and producer is that when I was a cinematographer, I would be doing sometimes two features, sometimes even three uh, a year. I'd be working all the time and I'd be on those film sets with my, with my friends, with my, with my film fam family. Uh, when you're a director, when you're a writer in particular, uh, you're locked in a room, um, you know, with a, a computer or with a, a fountain pen and no friends, uh, at all. Um, just writing and writing and writing and it's not uh, as much fun. I, I'm down with uh, Dorothy Parker, who said, I love having written. I hate writing. Well, <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of my view. I'm very proud of um, my last script, in particular, Dominion, the one with John Malkovich. And I'm very proud of Decoding Annie Parker and the next one coming up. But still, the process uh, of creating those stories, those scripts, very, very hard and very lonely. It, it is a very lonely process. And, uh, you know, I wanted to ask Steve, you know, I, I, when you've you know worked all these years as an accomplished cinematographer and, and you and, and you go back to your first love, which was writing. As odd as this question sounds, was there any skills that translated? Because I think there was. And, and here's the one I one skill I think that really translated well was you you will obviously lensing all these wonderful films and like like monster, you know, how that you you know have a, you have that image in your mind you have that that sort of mind's eye where you're saying okay I can imagine you know we're opening up on this mountain range or I imagine we're opening up on this sort of dark night and we can barely see I imagine that helps a lot with your exposition when you're writing scripts because when you're writing uh, you know this these action lines I imagine they're they're very very uh, well told because obviously you know exactly what it's going to look like because, hey, you're a cinematographer, you know, and you can bring all those years of imagery and seeing all these different things to, to your script. A am I right or am I, uh, or am I completely off base, Steve? <laughs> no, you're, 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 you're spot on and, and, and go to the very essence of my uh, philosophy and understanding of film. What I discovered, uh, both from first my reading when I was a, a student of, of philosophy and then later as a writer and then as a cinematographer, is that everything to do with film is a language. And we have to understand what a language is. A language is 
inevitably made up of two parts, uh, that which we intend to mean and that which we present to create that meaning, or what I think the philosophers called the signifier, that which the audience sees, and the signified, that which we mean, the idea that we're trying to present. As a cinematographer, you realize that when you compose a shot in a particular way, you can create a certain feeling in an audience. You can even suggest uh, an idea. When you push a camera forward on a dolly, for example, into a face, you're saying to an audience, uh, hey, what this character is about to say or do is important. That's not in a script, but the camera movement is the signifier. The idea of importance is the signified. And then I began analyzing everything I did as a cinematographer as a language. Uh, if I light with a backlight, that's the signifier. It's backlight signified mystery or uncertainty. An asymmetrical composition, that is the signifier. The signified, possibly a character who's alienated or a film like Wait Until Dark, a, a character who's at, uh, at risk. Um, to edit a shot where you do an extreme close-up and go to a very wide shot, the way David Lean uh, might have done, you're saying, oh, here's a person um, in, a, in a small little landscape. That's the signifier. The signify is the insignificance of the human condition, perhaps, or the weakness of that individual at that moment. So when I realize all those things, I realize that everything I put in a written script is, again, a matter of what I signify and, and uh, what, 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 it's, uh, what it means, um, uh, how, it, how it is indicated, and ultimately what I'm trying to convey to an audience. But I also realize that not everything can be done with the spoken word, that sometimes the most powerful, although the most enigmatic elements, are not written but uh, implied with the, uh, the photographic image. So as I write, I'm always thinking, is it better for the character to say this or is it better to have the character say very little and imply something simply with a composition or a camera movement or perhaps with the music or with the rhythm of the editing? If I begin to look at film, as I suggest everybody does, as a series of integrated languages, each with their own set of signifiers and each signifying different things, then I don't feel an obligation to put everything into a dialogue and the dialogue can become more economical and more real and the medium as a whole, integrating all these different processes becomes more effective. Does that make sense? Oh, it, it makes perfect sense. You know, a, a, as you were describing you know, your process, it, I, re, I was reminded of uh, There Will Be Blood and There Will Be Blood, the first 20 minutes, you know, there's no, there's no dialogue whatsoever. It's a lot of uh, of imagery. It's a lot of you know. We see Daniel Plainview as he's coming down into that into that pit looking for gold. He doesn't find gold, however. He finds oil, and that becomes his, he becomes that oil baron, oil tycoon, sociopathic businessman. But that first twenty minutes, there's absolutely no dialogue. And, right. and when I first saw that movie, I was like, "Wow, this is a really bold choice," uh, because. I mean, I imagine the pitch meeting for that. You know, if, you, if you say, if you're at a pitch meeting, oh, the first 20 minutes, there's no dialogue whatsoever. Uh, you know, it's it's just kind of, you know, it, it, but, uh, but you know, w once you start getting into the movie, it, it's, I, I mean, I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. And I mean, the only reason it lost Best Picture was because it was up against the uh, No Country for Old Men. And, you know, I, I, which is another movie very heavy in imagery. Uh, have, you, have you seen either of those movies, Stephen? I, I've seen them both and, and loved them both. And I, I would throw into that mix uh, Terry Malick's films, I, uh, Days of Heaven, which uh, was the film, I think, that inspired me more than any other to be a cinematographer. Uh, you know, Malick's uh, character's relationship to nature and nature being indifferent. And again, the visceral effect that nature's power, sublime majesty and indifference to us as as living, breathing souls uh, is important. So in a Terry Malick film, all the time he's cutting away to shots of uh, nature. Again, as you say, if a pitch meeting or a description to some investor, you're saying, well, a lot of these shots won't have any obvious meaning or won't uh, advance the story to the next plot point, but it'll be laden with meaning. It will make us understand uh, how indifferent nature and uh, a god or an absent god is to us and how that should make us potentially feel. And he does that almost exclusively in Days of Heaven with images, uh, not with uh, dialogue. He is combining languages. My feeling is that as a writer and as a director, you don't write your film in 
spoken language exclusively. You write your film in five different languages, like a very skilled linguist, and you combine those together to create meanings and choosing which language to use based on which is most effective and which goes to your audience's sensibilities. Yeah, you know that, that's very true because you know as I've been because I, I, I my first love is writing as well, and when when I'm writing a screenplay. There's so many different pairs of eyes to sort of look at it through. Uh, you know, there's an editor's eyes. There's, there's, uh, you know, the director's eyes. Sometimes you're thinking even in terms of being a producer. You know what I mean? And you're, sure. <laughs> and you, you're thinking of all these different uh, of, of different ways. And then, but when you're adding all these layers into your actual writing, you know, you're you're really, you know, because uh, you're you're trying to sort of hook the reader, as they say, you know, hook the reader in the first couple of pages, but you have to hook them throughout the whole story. You're trying to always, you know, keep that tension in there. You're trying to, you know, you're sort of, you know, wearing a lot of different hats. You're doing a lot of different things at the, at the micro and the macro levels. You're right. And it's very, very hard, uh, particularly when we start talking about producing, because, you know, the person or persons who may determine whether your film gets made may have never made a film and may have no understanding of cinematic language. Uh, of what composition does, camera movement, may not have seen a Terry Malick film, may not have seen a Paul Thomas Anderson film, um, may not have seen a Coen Brothers film. Uh, they may have read uh, McKee's book on story and take that template and apply it to your script. And if your script does not use that template, they may feel that your script is a failed one. And this is uh, difficult for all writers and all artists to determine. Do you do uh, what the orthodoxy in our film community suggests, ergo giving you a better chance of getting your film made, or do you protect your singular vision, be it part of that orthodoxy or not, in the belief that you know better how best to express the ideas you hope to express? It's it's interesting because unlike other art forms, ours is so very expensive that there is a inhibiting element, and that's the one of uh, finance. People backing a film want to know their investment is safe and therefore are looking for absolute metrics to determine what will make your film a good investment for them. They're not interested in your ideas about how to engage an audience viscerally with a composition. They want to know that if the rules of which they may be aware uh, are applied, uh, does that mean your film will succeed? And if it will, will they make more money? And that's a very difficult way to approach filmmaking. Yeah, absolutely. A friend of mine, you know, we, he and I were just discussing this as well because, you know, he was a part of a film. The film was already, everything was casted. They were about to shoot and then suddenly it just all went away. And he said, Dave, it's happened too many times in my career to count. And he says it, it just, you know, it, it happens sometimes where, you know, the money goes away. And then uh, there's been other times where he's been pitching a project for, for years and years and years. And it's finally you, you, you get a financier and you can, you're able to finally find that money. Uh, I, I had Kazian Ilves on this podcast and he was discussing how he found the money for Dallas Buyers Club. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those things where he had a connection from years ago who was willing to help him out out of a bind. And it was, you know, one of those cases where your network really is your net worth. Uh, No question. I mean, you've got to build relationships and contacts and then you've got to convince people to give you their money to make uh, your film. And again, uh, there's a natural conservative factor in all that and that they don't want you to take a lot of risks because, they don't know that that will generate money for them necessarily. I mean, we all want the investor who says, just go ahead and make what you believe, but those are rare. Most investors want to get involved and say, okay, we're giving you this money. What's our best way of guaranteeing this? Uh, Are you definitely going to have three acts and are your plot points going to come on the right pages and all the rest of it? And again, that may or may not be the best way to write a script, but that's what they want because that's what they've been told is the way to success. And that, as I say, could be very inhibiting for uh, a writer, for creative artists. I'm sure that uh, Terry Malick uh, doesn't work to that template. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, Charlie Kaufman doesn't work to that template. Uh, I'm pretty sure the, the, the Coen brothers don't. 
Uh, and they're some of the most uh, successful and important filmmakers we have working. So these are some of the tough decisions that filmmakers have to make, particularly when you go to finance your film, uh, because you want that money, but you also want to make a great movie. Yeah, uh, you know, a- absolutely. And I, you know, when, when we when as because writing is my first love as well, and when we're writing these scripts, sometimes there's a tendency to write with that producer's hat because you're wondering, oh, would this be able to be, you know, will this be too much money? Will I be able to even obtain this? Uh, you know, stuff, you know, and that sort of, as I find writing the first draft, we have to kind of sort of brush that aside and just sort of focus on just telling the best single story possible that we can tell. And then later on when you're maybe doing rewrites or you're in, in different meetings and you can sort of take things out and maybe add things in and then sort of, you know, the, the story sort of evolves. And it kind of ties in with what we were talking about before where, you know, we set off in the beginning with these expectations that's going to go into a straight line and then suddenly it, it's zigzagging all over the map and <laughs> and we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, finding these obstacles and we're, we're trying to turn these obstacles into either they can either set us back or we can move forward with them. You make a great point, and I always try to write my first draft in seven days or less, and there's a reason for that. I call it a slop draft, not a first draft, because what I want to do is write so quickly that I don't have time to think. So first there's the idea of just an intuitive understanding of character, but also I find that I write to know what I think that if I try to outline before I begin writing, the ideas are only, are only notional. I really don't know my characters. I don't know my story that well. I think I do, and I can try to plot it out, and I can draw all sorts of diagrams and put all sorts of index cards up, but it's not really fully uh, realized. Then if I take a different approach and simply start writing and say, I'm going to write 120 pages in seven days, what I discover is that by the time I get to that last page, I have developed an understanding of character. I have developed an understanding of what the narrative should be, and I might even understand some of the subtext. Then I go back and I begin the real process of writing, which is rewriting. But I couldn't have done that if I tried to make that first draft perfect. And you talked about wearing your producer's hat. I think it's essential, and I think you've made a very good point, that when you're writing, you're thinking of nothing except those characters. I don't care how long a dialogue scene goes on for or how outrageous what the characters say are or off, or if they begin in a Proustian fashion talking about things that have nothing to do with the story at all because, in fact, that's what people do in real life is talk about things that uh, don't necessarily have to do with the advancement of their individual plot. And then when you write that version, that slop version, and look at it, to me it is uh, the, the door to all things. You come to an understanding of everything that's important about your film, and then you can put those things, those things in when you go back to, uh, to rewrite. It's a crazy way of writing, but it works very well for me. Well, you know, I actually think that's a very good way of writing uh, because you know, even when I have you know, started writing stuff in the past, and, and even now sometimes when I sit down to start writing, one of two things happens. Number one is you get distracted very easily. I think as this happens to everybody where, you know, your phone chimes or somebody at your door, uh, your friend calls you and says, Hey Steve, can you help me move? <laughs> I hmm. have to, you know, uh, can you take me to the airport? And the, the second thing is you have paralysis through analysis where you're sitting at your desk, you know, you're, or, or wherever you're writing and suddenly you're just kind of like, Oh, wouldn't it be cool if, and you start brainstorming and you're just basically, you're, you're just spinning your wheels, so to speak. No, exactly right. And I I think this is, to me, it was a breakthrough. You know, I was so concerned with failing that I was preventing myself from succeeding. So when I was convinced, ultimately, that I should write badly, I sat down and wrote, wrote the worst script I possibly could. And when it was finished, it was truly terrible. But it pointed the way to a much better script, a script that was so good. This is what I did with Dominion, that when I sent it to uh, John Malkovich, uh, he signed up uh, immediately, and it was a low-budget film, but John loved the writing of that script because the dialogue seemed so natural and so imaginative to him. If I had written Dominion to an outline, my characters would have been speaking to deliver the next plot point, to get to the next subject, 
to keep the story moving along as it had been outlined. But the way I wrote Dominion was I simply had my characters talk about things that were important to them and then went back on the next draft and then imposed a form on that. And it was much more natural. The writing was much better. And it's a system that, that simply works. I say to all writers, and I have a lot of uh, assistants that work with me, don't try to be perfect on the first draft or don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Simply write as quickly as you possibly can and then discover what you always meant to say and never realized it. You know, I, I like that approach, Steve, where, you know, you gave yourself permission to fail and yeah. you basically said, I'm going to write the worst possible thing. You know, I, I was talking to another friend, a colleague of mine, uh, Jason Brubaker, and he had, had a theory about, you know, guys who always talk about making a film. They always, you know, I, and you've met guys like this too, Steve, where they're always saying things like, oh, I have this great idea for a film, uh, you know, me and my buddies, blah, 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 but they never actually make it. And the and his theory, Jason's theory, was that the reason they don't make it is because if it does suck, if it is bad, it's a reflection of them as an artist and it kind of encompasses their entire career in sort of one foul swoop. So if they do write a bad screenplay or make one bad movie, well, you suck. You're never going to make anything. Do you know what I mean, Steve? I know exactly what you mean. And I tell you, the majority of people, not just in film, but in life, most people would rather talk about something than do it. Most people would rather criticize others than do it. Um, those who criticize and don't do are always safe because they can't possibly fail and can always make clear how superior they are because they can criticize that which you did. Look, I, uh, when I made Dominion, uh, a lot of people said, oh, well, Stephen, you had trouble finishing it. Uh, there were some money issues, etc." all of which uh, were true and those were resolved. But the th thing is, I did it. Uh, had I simply not done it and watched others, I don't know if I would have the sense of self that I have. I'm, I'm proud of what I've done. I've done it because I've taken risks. But you go to a very important point. If you want to make films, you have to make films. And if you're going to do that, it means you're going to take risks. It means people are going to criticize uh, and ridicule you. And you may even fail. But I'd much rather do and fail than observe and criticize others. Yeah, and that is beautiful, Steve, because honestly, that is so true. You know, I, and I think we all have somebody in our lives or we've known somebody that, like that in our lives where they don't want to actually do anything. They may talk a big game or they constantly criticize what other people are doing and kind of like downplay it uh, You know, in that sort of condescending sort of um, very uh, uh, almost like – uh, jaded type of attitude where they're like, oh yeah, that you're going to make a movie this weekend. That's cool. You know what I mean? They just yeah. like they, and people like that, you know, if they never do anything, they're always just sort of criticizing others from the comfort of their couch. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? I completely know what you mean. And I, I look, I pay tribute to anyone who takes a risk in their life of any kind. Uh, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't sometimes be safe, but you only, I think have one life. You only have a few opportunities, and when they're presented to you, uh, seize them. I know when we started Decoding Annie Parker, um, we had uh, spent a long time raising the money, and I got a little bit of money from India, some from Canada. I was very lucky and got the tax credit in California, and we were very, very close, within like $100,000 of what we needed. And the producers all got on the phone with each other, and we had to decide what to do. And at that point, Helen Hunt had read the script and loved it, and had signed up for a very reasonable sum of money. We had Samantha Morton. Uh, uh, Helen, of course, won an Oscar. Samantha had been nominated for two. Uh, I had met Aaron Paul, and we had become fast friends. And Aaron Paul, who was at the height of his fame with Breaking Bad, had uh, agreed to do it. Corey Stahl and I uh, had uh, gotten close as he had read the script, and we talked about the evolution of the characters. Rashida Jones, uh, Bradley Whitford, just this incredible cast we'd put together. And we were on the phone considering whether we should pull the plug because we didn't have quite uh, enough money. And I ultimately decided that we would uh, go ahead. And I realized it was a huge uh, risk and we nearly had to shut down. I think we did shut down for a day at the end of a week and then we went and raised more money and we managed to finish the film. Went on to win the Sloan Award at the Hamptons. It 
won uh, Best Actress for Samantha Morton at Seattle, won the Milan Film Festival, uh, two or three awards there, uh, raised a couple of million dollars for charities, etc. We pulled it off. But there was a moment uh, in that process where we had to decide whether to play it safe or to take a considerable risk. And I think those moments come often in film because uh, I think it was Hitchcock that once said that drama is uh, life with the boring bits taken out. I would suggest that filmmaking is uh, life with um, the calm bits taken out. So it's a constant state of uh, risk and uh, near hysteria and certain failure. And from that, you extract, hopefully, a film and a bit of a life. And, and you know, as we talk about your projects, you know, I, I, I wanted to ask, you know, when you started to, to actually go from that cinematographer's sort of chair, so to speak, to being a director, you know, what were some of the things that you've picked up? I mean, because you've, you've had a lot of, of really cool directors, like Patty being the first example that I can think of. You know, uh, what were some of the things that you saw that these directors were doing when they were talking to actors or maybe even talking to you as a cinematographer, you know, when, and talking about, you know, a, a shot list and, here, and, and hey, Stephen, here's my storyboard. You know, what are some of the, the, the great things that they have done over the years that you sort of took into your projects? Well, it wasn't just Patty. It was uh, John Favreau. I worked with uh, a couple of times. John and I are friends. Um, Noah Baumbach, of course. I did three films with Noah Baumbach, which was uh, you know fantastic. So uh, I had uh, an opportunity to work with lots of uh, Taylor Hackford, of course. I mean, lots of other uh, great directors. And I took something of value from um, each of them. Uh, certainly always grateful to my training at the BBC and always grateful to all my stage actors and what I learned there. But I learned as I observed about different uh, management systems, different uh, leadership uh, methodologies and different ways of working with uh, actors and with uh, with crews. Uh, Noah and I, uh, before we did both uh, Kicking and Screaming and Mr. Jealousy and Highball, spent a lot of time uh, prepping. Uh, we were in Noah's place in, uh, in, in Greenwich Village, and we would go through the entire script, um, scene by scene, shot by shot, determining not only what we plan to shoot, but why we're shooting it, what, uh, what the camera would mean, going back to what I was saying before about signifier and signified. They're going to use a wide shot or a close shot. Uh, Noah would show me clips from movies that he liked and said, this is very important to me. Could we... Uh, infuse this sequence with the same feeling from this film. I remember on uh, Mr. Jealousy, uh, he'd been much influenced by the French Nouveau Vague, so we were using those uh, kind of uh, circular fade-outs, and even the music that he chose was very much in that style, but also compositionally, the way the camera moved and the way I lit it uh, all had to be in the style of the uh, Nouveau Vague. So um, uh, that was uh, exciting. That's what's so a great about a collaborator like uh, Noah is that he had a very clearly determined vision of not only what his characters were, but stylistically what he wanted to do. And that would be a great starting place for me to then run with uh, some of my own ideas. I bring him uh, books from painters or uh, from designers uh, or from other filmmakers, photographers for that period. And so what about this? What if we did this like this and so on? And uh, we would integrate some of my ideas into his vision. Uh, Patty, I think I told you about her focus very much on actors, how um, Patty, uh, at the end of every performance, uh, rather than speaking to any of the crew, would drop the headphones and make a beeline directly for the actor. Uh, it doesn't matter what anyone else had to say to her, her, her first point of contact after a take was those actors to tell them that they had been observed, that they're being protected, that... Uh, someone is listening because that's what actors want most of all is to know the actor be an experienced uh, director or an inexperienced director those actors want to know that there's someone watching uh, protecting them creating a rarefied safe environment where uh, someone's making sure that their performance is okay and will tell them honestly if it isn't and Patty really uh, did that to a, a great degree John Favreau uh, it was the the atmosphere on set um, it's kind of like he felt strongly that uh, what happens on set somehow appears on screen. So his sets were fun and, and light, full of energy, um, full of comedy, uh, and a very, very gentle uh, hand that everyone felt protected and facilitated. And again, that lent itself to what appeared 
uh, on screen. Taylor Hackford, uh, very, very well prepared and would cover things from every possible angle, knowing that whatever he planned, he knew that he might alter it in the cutting room and wanted to make sure that he had plenty of material to uh, to cut that with. So for me, 30 years of observing some of the best directors in the world was a wonderful education for me, and uh, it informs everything I do now. But what was even better educationally was watching some truly terrible directors uh, get yeah. it wrong. And I got to watch that uh, as well, and I'm not going to mention their names, uh, but it helped me to know what not to do. So to accumulate all that knowledge uh, and to be able to walk onto uh, the first feature that I directed, knowing what these great directors had done and what the bad directors had done and what I should or shouldn't do was a huge uh, help to me. It, uh, it still is. And you you mentioned this too, Stephen. You have thirty years of experience. You know you you have you know started out as a writer. You be, you became this accomplished cinematographer. You've won uh, this just plethora of awards. You got to see all these great sort of you know all these great directors and all the things that they that they did right and and sort of put this all together for your own projects. But I know now you're you're also doing some seminars, uh, which you know you're you know going going to impart all this knowledge, which I think is phenomenal. So uh, could you just you know talk a little bit about some of the seminars you have coming up? Uh, absolutely. Um, for years, um, really starting back to right about the time I left the BBC, I began uh, teaching. If uh, uh, somebody was a writer and wanted to know something about cinematography, because I had done both those things, I was uniquely able to explain in, in a plain language for a writer or a director what a cinematographer uh, does. And then later, um, when I began directing, um, I could go into great detail to people about what each below-the-line crew member uh, did. And when I was producing, I could explain to uh, the investors why we needed money for different things, what the uh, post-production crew would be doing, what the uh, on-set crew would be doing, why we needed as many makeup people as, as we needed, and so on. So... I was always uh, teaching, sometimes formally. I taught at the International Film School in London. I had a film school of my own in in uh, the UK, in London. Um, I set a film school up in New Brunswick in, uh, in Canada. Um, I've taught at universities, including USC here and others uh, all around uh, the country. And uh, I wrote a book about uh, film production that covers uh, all these things. And then finally, I just thought... Um, you know, uh, I should uh, formalize this and make it available to uh, a lot more people than I've made it available to in the past. So we're taking uh, right now six of my most popular um, lectures, uh, one on making the independent film, how you actually put together an independent film, how you find the money, um, how you use that money to shoot the film, how you take it through posts and get into sales and distribution. Another one about uh, for stills photographers, because so many stills photographers have come to me and saying, hey, I want to be a cinematographer. I bought this uh, camera. I've done stills work, but how is cinematography different from photography, and particularly with lighting? So I've uh, done that. So many directors and producers want to know about uh, cinematography, how it works. So I, I've uh, running a course on um, cinematography for non-cinematographers. Um, and so many actors I've worked with, um, both on stage and on screen, feel uncomfortable um, when they first step onto a film set. And I wanted to run a seminar so that actors would know what it's like to come onto a film set and what the assistant directors do, what the, the uh, first assistant directors do, what the, the director wants, what the cinematographer wants. So, so all those things, very useful uh, for them. And then going back to something you and I have talked about a lot in this, in, this, in this discussion is I wanted very much to run a course for writers so they would understand the technical aspects of filmmaking and they could employ that in their writing to make them better um, screenwriters. So, yeah, we set that up. Uh, we've got a website called uh, somebodystudios.com. Uh, uh, you can see uh, all the uh, seminars uh, there. Uh, people can sign up. I think that they, uh, uh, from the time they sign up, they've got a month to watch uh, the individual seminar they've selected, or they can sign up for multiple ones. And the course has been very successful uh, in the past. 
Uh, not only do uh, I uh, teach the course, but then afterwards I have a, a Q&A and uh, we keep the lines open and we make sure people have access to me in the future for advice. Uh, I want to help others as I've been helped uh, over all these uh, many years. And uh, I uh, really very much looking forward to it. Uh, July the 15th, uh, we go live with everything. So we're getting very close to that date. So I hope people go to the website, picks on the offer themselves and uh, see what they might be able to learn. And I will also link to uh, link to the your your seminars in the show notes, uh, you know, as well as any other uh, site you have, Stephen. And it's just you know great too because it's something that I've learned over the years. Whenever I'm going to take a seminar or a webinar or or, or read a book uh, or a, like, a, like a filmmaking book, one thing I always my 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 one sort of barrier to entry to reading it or buying it is the person has had to have some kind of experience. I I think you've also seen it, Stephen, where you you sort of buy, see a book in the in maybe a, in a Barnes and Nobles or an Amazon, and you and you see that they're you know the the person that wrote it has never written a screenplay or <laughs> never actually made a, made a film, and and you say to yourself. Well, what would they possibly know about something that they've never done? It, it's it's a lot like me teaching you how to build a car, and then saying, "Well, I'm not a mechanic, nor have yeah. I ever designed one." I see you. You've actually you've been there. You know, you've done that. You've done it many, many times over thirty years. And you know, and again, that's why I was blown away by having you on this podcast uh, because you know you've you've done. I mean. I'm going to be honest with you, Stephen. Half baked. I remember watching that movie on repeat over and over again. Uh, you know, growing up because it was just absolutely hilarious. I mean, you've been able to sort of go in and out of you know comedy with Half Baked and Scary Movie Two into Monster, which is more of a of a of a of a, uh, uh, of a not only is it drama, but it's also a, a personal introspective of the of these two women who are you know uh, who are you know literal and figurative monsters and then you know you you now you're doing your own projects so it's always good to learn from somebody who's actually has gone out there and done it yeah well thank you and i i have done a lot of uh, different things i'm a producer uh, now a director a writer uh, a cinematographer um, it's not to always been easy but it's interesting when you get to uh farther down the road you realize how each of these things informs the other. I'm a better producer because I was a, a cinematographer. I'm a better director uh, because I'm a writer and a cinematographer. And it's not just the, the, the films that are being made. I, I, I guess in the last 18 months, I've been commissioned to write five other uh, major feature films. It's been a very, very busy period for us. We have a TV series that's an advanced stage of development. Uh, and the reason I am now writing so quickly uh, and so efficiently is that I'm borrowing from my other experiences as a producer, as a cinematographer, uh, as a director. And I realize what I need to write and what I don't. I understand um, what will work best and what works most efficiently. And uh, it's a help. So, look, if I can help others understand all these things based on my, uh, my experience, I'm more than happy to uh, impart it to them. And, you know, Stephen, I, I know we're just about out of time. And I want to, again, say thank you so much for coming on and imparting your wisdom here for the past hour. Uh, and, and just in closing, uh, where can people find you out online? Uh, you know, do you have any other social media links? And uh, also, you may, and just to give that seminar link again? Well, it's uh, the key one to go to, and this links to pretty much everything to do with me, is uh, uh, somebodystudios.com. Uh, um, you can also find uh, me, um, um, Stephen Bernstein, writer-director, uh, online, and there's usually links to our courses or what's going on in my life uh, there. Uh, Steve Bernstein, director-writer on Instagram uh, as well. And, of course, as I say, somebodystudios.com is pretty much available on all uh, social media uh, platform. So we really hope that people might join us. Thanks. And and everyone, I will link to that in our show notes on the Dave Bulls podcast. It's at DaveBulls.com. Twitter, you can find me at Dave underscore Bullis. Stephen Bernstein, I want to say thank you so much for coming on, sir. Uh, my uh, very great pleasure. It was a great talk. Thank you so much. Anytime, Stephen, and anytime you want to come back on, please let me know. I'd love to have you back on because, I, I mean, you and I could talk for hours. I, I could tell, you know, even this hour just flew by, uh, honestly. It, it, it did. There's so much more I want to say, so let's, uh, let, let's try to do it again in the future. That would be great. My, uh, it sounds great, sir. Take care. You too, then. Bye-bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.